What is the foundation of your life built upon? Solid rock or sinking sand? When the storms of life come and go, what is left behind? Your life is always moving towards something. Your life is always building on something. Your life is always built with something. Again, good morning. I'm so excited all of you are here. There's not a person that is here by accident or joining us online that is, that is here by chance. And so I'm so excited that all of us are here, gathered here right now, to dive into God's Word together as we engage or embark in a historic Sunday for us as a church. And so I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to Exodus 35. Uh, Exodus 35, you start at the very beginning of your Bible, go to Genesis, head right on over to Exodus, and you'll be there. Exodus 35 is where we'll be this morning. And I want to bring you back uh, to a week ago today where 700 of us were gathered out on the orchard property to break ground, to celebrate, eat hot dogs and hamburgers, and just have a great time. It was an absolutely beautiful moment. Amen. Man, that just the weather was incredible. The, 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 all of our kids, so, well, so many of our kids were running all over the place, having fun and laughing. Uh, people were meeting people that haven't met yet in our church, many of them who've been apart since, uh, since the beginning, some who just came on board. And so people are meeting each other and celebrating. There's just an excitement out there on that property. It was so fun to be a part of. Matter of fact, I went home that night and I told Joy, I said, I feel like that was a really small glimpse into what heaven's going to be like. Just us, just gathered together with a lot more brothers and sisters from every tribe, nation, and tongue, just celebrating, worshiping, meeting people, eating great food. It was just, it was such a powerful moment. But then I started thinking, we broke ground and we had some hot dogs and hamburgers. It was an awesome time out there. But now what's next? What's next for us? What is our next step? Well, that next step for us is today. It's right now. And we're going to see our next step and how we as a church can build the kingdom of God. Because that's ultimately what we're building. We are not building a building, although it will be a building. But ultimately what you and I are doing is we are building a building to build the kingdom of God. That we are building a home, a place for us to gather together, to worship Jesus, to be sent out from there in the most strategic place in our entire region. A place where people can, a hospital for people to come and hear the gospel. A place where it will be open, where people can meet and gather all throughout the week. It's going to be a place to build the kingdom, not to build us. It's for our community. And I'm so excited about that. And we're going to look this morning at how we build the kingdom of God. And we're going to look at a story from a group of people who are in a very similar situation that we are in today. The Israelites. Now, while the Israelites, there's a lot of difference between us, there's also a lot of similarities between where they were in Exodus 35 and where we are today. So if you remember back into just biblical narrative for a little bit, biblical history, after the fall, after man has sinned against God, man continues to populate the earth. And in Genesis 12, God calls a man named Abram. He says, hey, leave everything, and I'm going to go show you where you're supposed to go. Obey me, and I'm going to bless you. So Abram and his wife Sarai does, later named Abraham and Sarah, and they have a son, Isaac. And God continues that covenant relationship with Isaac. And so then Isaac grows up and he has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is then given the covenant blessing of God that he gave to Isaac, that he gave to Abraham. And Jacob is later renamed by God himself as Israel. His name then becomes Israel. And so Jacob, or Israel, has 12 sons, and those 12 sons begin to have families to build this tribe, or we now call the Israelites, and they become a huge nation. And then for 400 years, they are enslaved in Egypt, in captivity. And then at the end of those 400 years, God comes back into their their narrative, their story, 
He delivers them from slavery, from Pharaoh, and he calls them out to walk with him in faith to a land that he has promised them to build a city, to build a nation that he desires to build through them. And so they, in this moment, have already been delivered out of Egypt, delivered out of slavery, and now they're in the wilderness, they're in the desert, and they are, God is giving them commands to do something very specific, to build. Matter of fact, specifically, he's calling them to build a building, the tent of meeting and all the things that go along with it. And so there are many similarities that we're going to see this morning from their story and ours. And we're going to see how they responded to God, and then we are going to decide how we're going to respond to God this morning from this passage of Scripture. So join with me in Gen- or excuse me, Exodus 35, beginning in verse 4, and we're going to break this passage up into three major sections. Here's what Moses says to the people from God at this pivotal moment when they're asking, what's next? What are we supposed to do next? Let's see. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of willing heart, let him bring it as a, excuse me, let him bring it as the Lord's contribution. Then he lists off what those things are that they are called to bring. Gold, silver, and bronze. And blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, ram's skins, dyed red, and porpoise skins, which I found out between services that porpoise skins were what they carried all these gifts in. Yeah. Anybody got porpoise skins this morning? Come on. Anyway, we'll continue on. We don't need porpoise skins. And acacia wood, and oil for lighting, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onks stones, and setting stones for the ephod, and for the breast piece. Now, I want to pray for us this morning as we dive into how this story applies to this day for us as a church. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for this morning, and God, I am so amped. You see my heart and mind that I am so excited to see how we as your church respond to your word, to your spirit, and to your movement. And so, Father, I pray that every heart and soul in this place would be right. That, Father, today we would commit what you've called us to commit with a generous, willing, ready heart. And Father, I know that there's some people here, like there were at 930. And God, they, they don't need to commit to the building. They need to commit to Christ. Amen. And God, I pray that today, that person, those people, would be saved. That they would repent and believe this morning and come to Jesus. Father, I pray that you would do an eternally awesome work this morning. That none of us can take any credit for. That none of us... that for all eternity we will stand in amazement for. God bless this moment now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Here's the first truth we're going to see this morning from this story. is that building God's kingdom takes faithful giving. That's right. Building God's church takes, or building God's kingdom takes faithful giving. Look how this story starts off. Remember, these people are not understanding what's next. God has delivered them out of slavery. They're out here in the desert. They're going to this promised land that none of them have ever seen before. There's a lot of mystery here. There's a lot of unknown. There's a lot of what are we supposed to be doing? And so then Moses stands up and he says, all right, guys, here's the plan. Here's what God wants us to do. And the first thing that he tells tells them is, we are, God is commanding you to bring an offering, a contribution to the Lord. Uh, there's a couple of points I want to make about that. First, he says that God is commanding it, that God is calling it. Listen, some people maybe here this morning and like, ah, I, I, God hasn't called me to do anything or commanded anything of me. Listen, if you're a part of this church family, the, the calling's on you already. The command of God is on you already. 
to be a part of what he's doing. Listen, when you sign on with Jesus, when you say yes to Christ and you literally say, Jesus, save me, forgive me for all my sins, I repent and believe in you. It's not just a one-time deal. It's where you and I for the rest of our lives are still repenting and still believing in Jesus. And when we get saved, we hand over the rights of our life to him. That's right. And so the calling is already on you. The command is already on you to be his people. The command now for you, for each one of our families is, what is he specifically calling and commanding you to do? So the command is there, but look what happens after that. Look what happens. Look what God says to the people. This is the command. Here's what I'm telling you to do. Bring a contribution to the Lord. And then he says, whoever is of a willing heart, bring it as the Lord's contribution. Whoever's got a willing heart. Whoever's heart is right and ready to be a part of what I'm doing. He commanded them, but he also wanted their hearts. Listen, this morning, God may have called you, may have put a specific number on you, or maybe he, he may just be calling you to give a part of this, and you have fought him all month, and, and for longer than that, fought him on it. That's not us, or that's not what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that. Listen, God's command, it doesn't have to deal with your finances. It has to deal with your heart. They had a willing heart. They were people who said, I want in on what God is doing. I want to be a part of what God is doing. He has commanded it, but I want to be all in. I heard a friend of mine share this with me about his preacher would say this to him often or to his whole congregation. If God commands us to give and we don't, God's going to get it one way or another. That's right. Have you ever, I've never, and I've never thought of it like that. All of us that sometimes just stand tight-fisted before God. Well, if God's moving, if God's going to do something, He's going to do it through you willingly with a generous heart, as, he's, as these people did here, or at the flick of a wrist, at the blink of His eye, He will pull it from you. Yep. He'll get it one way or another because it's his. That's right. Everything that we have is his. Amen. Well, no, it's not. It's mine. Take it with you when you die. Come on. Come on. Take it with you. If it's yours, if it's really got your name on it, then take it with you. None of it is. Uh, an African-American preacher, E.V. Hill, one of the most powerful preachers, Dr. Horn shared this story with us. He would tell his people often, a man can take credit for nothing. A man can take credit for nothing. I can stand up here and say, I am responsible for nothing. That's what I can truly take credit for. Amen. But anything above nothing, the pastor went on to say, anything above nothing has been given to me by God. Everything. Every single thing that I own, that I wear, that I have, that, that, it, that has ever been in my possession at other point, I can take credit for nothing, but God has given me everything above nothing. I, the guy explained to me, and I thought that was brilliant. I've never thought about that before. He said, Blake, he was telling me this. This is a church member telling me this. He said, Blake, listen. He said, that preacher went on to say, listen, if we close our fists before God, when he's wanting to do a powerful thing, he'll cause an air conditioner to go out. He'll blow out a car engine. He'll do something. He'll make it at the flick of a wrist. He will flip our business on its head. And all that money that he had called us to give, he will take it and give it to somebody else who, guess what, will give it to him. Amen. Listen, he's going to get it one way or another. The difference is whether or not it is taken from you and you get no eternal reward for it. You get no, 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 no benefit from that blessing of being a part of that. Or you do. And the difference is not... Hearing a sermon, the difference is not well, how you were feeling that day. The difference is your heart. It's your heart. It's my heart. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and his wife, dear friends of mine. And they were talking about today, about this, this whole thing, about what God is calling them to give. And they were both kind of like, I don't know if you can put these two words together, but like anxiously excited about it. Like it was really going to push them, I could tell, but also they were super excited about it. And the wife looked at me and she said, Blake, I'm just going to be honest with you. The number that God has placed on us is more money than he made all last year. And that paused me. 
That, honestly, that astounded me. And she sent it to me with a smile on her face. And then she said, but we trust God. We know that he's leading us to do this, and we're all in. We're, we're all in. Now, the husband was like, well, I ain't all in. I don't know about you, but I, I'm not all in yet. No, I'm just kidding. They were both. They were, they were both so full of joy and contentment. Where does that come from? Where does that type of generosity to think, hey, whatever I make, whatever I made all last year, God's calling me to commit all of that. Like, that, that's absurd. Like, if the world heard that, if the world heard that some of us are doing things like that, they would be like, well, you're ridiculous. Save your money or spend it. Are you kidding me? Give it? You know the difference is? Your heart. Your heart. Giving is an act of our hearts. Because when we give, here's what we say from our hearts. It's not mine. It's not mine. And the things of this world have no hold on my heart. Now, that's not to say that we don't take care of our families. That's not to say that we don't save for college for our families, if you're able to. Like that's, I'm not saying just completely just abandon all. And you may. God may be calling you to do that. But when we give, it's a matter of us holding our hands out to God and saying, all this stuff, all this world doesn't have this heart. Only you do. It's an act of worship. It's an act of praise. So number one way that we build God's kingdom is it's going to take faithful giving. But secondly, building God's kingdom, it takes skillful giving. It takes skillful giving. We're going to go through this one really quickly just by looking at one verse. Verse 10. It says, here's what Moses commands. So Moses is telling the people, we want you to give what you have willingly from your heart. But then secondly, he's telling them, give what you are. Look what he says here. Let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. So not only was God leading the people to give what they had. Now remember too, remember this giving that he was commanding and calling these people to do. He was calling homeless nomads to do. Like these people had no homes. They were leaving Egypt, leaving slavery. They were not leaving the, the wealth and prestige and had these really nice RVs that they were driving across the desert in. No, it wasn't the case. They were walking across there with bags, with, with, with donkeys carrying their stuff. Like they didn't have a ton and then God is calling them to give? What? Yes. He was calling them to not only give what they have, what he had been given to them, what he had given them, but also he was calling them to give who they were. Listen, every skillful man, you come forward and make this stuff, build this stuff. He's calling the people who had the ability to build, to build. Now, how does that apply to us? Some of you may have the ability to build, some of you may not. But what Moses was commanding the people is, bring who you are to the table. Listen, the skills that you have, men and women, the abilities that you have, the passions that you have. God not only calls us to give our money, give our stuff, He calls us to give who we are to Him. It is by no accident that some of you love to build. It's by no accident that some of you love to create or craft or you are passionate about this sport or this, this hobby or this thing. That is not by accident. God has actually wired you together in such a way so that you can take those things that you love doing and use them for the kingdom of God to bless other people, to bless His church. Amen. And I hope that your mind is stirring right now, thinking about the things that you're passionate about, the things that you enjoy. God has wired those in you to glorify Him through. Now, I want to pause right here, and I want us to be reminded of something. Because any time that a pastor stands up and talks about giving, or a pastor stands up and talks about serving, there's always sometimes this pushback. Man, I'm, I'm already doing so much. You, you want me to give more? You want me, to, you want me to serve more? Like, are you kidding me? You know, get a, get a life, man. We all don't do what you do. I know it. I hear it. I feel it. But I want to remind you 
that you and I serve and worship and follow a God who did not consider heaven right until he pulled a bunch of wretched sinners out of their sin into his kingdom. That he left the eternal glories, the awesome majesty, the perfection of eternity. He leaves those things, comes down to earth, lives a humble, simple life, dies on a cross for a crime that he didn't commit. Matter of fact, trillions of crimes that he didn't commit. He then is buried in the cross, buried in the tomb. He resurrects from the grave, and then he calls us to this wild adventure of following him. That actually following him and being a servant of him is where we're actually going to find freedom and hope and a part of that is serving him and worshiping him so here's the deal if you if you in your minds are starting to retaliate or push back and think he just wanted me to do more no I'm asking us to follow the example of the one who gave everything for us there is not a sacrifice in this room that could hold a candle to God's sacrifice for us through Christ There is not one thing that you and I can give up that God would look at and say, Woo! Wow! That's amazing! In the face of His suffering Son. We sang that lyric just the other day. So powerful. To the one who gave me life, there is no sacrifice. And you and I bringing these these forward this morning. You and I giving our lives to the kingdom of God to serve the church. That is no sacrifice. That is a response to the awesome love and mercy of God. If you see you're serving, you going to church as some sacrifice you have to struggle through then you need a wider and a broader and a deeper view of the mercy and the beauty and the wonder and the love of God for you. Our response to God is awe and worship. What do you want from me, God? What do you want? You gave me everything. I have everything. Ephesians 1, in Christ all the heavenly blessings exist. Amen. I think when we get to heaven, this is just my opinion, okay? So take that for what it's worth. I think that we will be rewarded in heaven for how we lived on this earth. I've told you guys that before. It's, that's true in Scripture. That is not opinion. That's fact. As Marcus Aurelius said in Gladiator, what we do in life echoes in eternity. And that's true. That's a biblical principle. He just stole it. But I think, and I'm speaking just for me, I do believe God will reward me for the few things that I got right on this planet. But I think for the first 20,000 years that I'm in heaven, I won't even know there's rewards in heaven for me because I will be so fixated and so blown away by the majesty and awesomeness and beauty of Jesus that I will literally just look at him and say, wow! And then 20,000 years later, he may say, hey, Blake, you got a couple of gifts back there from me. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, thank you. Even more thank you. Wow! Amen. This is no sacrifice That's right. for the one who gave us life. Praise you. Praise you. Man, Come on. y'all are more excited that 930 crowd too. Hey, I want to bring this all together this morning because I want to share with you a story. But the last truth this morning that we're going to see is building God's kingdom, it takes cheerful giving. It takes cheerful giving. I want to read as we bring all this together, verse 20 through 29. Here's how the people responded. So the first two sections are, here's what God was calling them to do. Give what you have, give who you are. Then here's their response. Here's what they decide to do in their hearts. So then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work. They brought it. Their hearts stirred them. They heard what God wanted and they said, let's go. Let's do it. Let's go all in. Let's build this building that the Lord is calling us to give. I've never even seen a tent of meeting, but we're going to build it. Here we go. And so they start building. And then, oh, this is the second time. Five times in this passage, Moses recalls their hearts are stirred. 
Then, verse 22, all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought uh, brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets and all articles of gold. So did every man who presented an offering of gold to the Lord. And every man who had in his possession blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen and goat's hair and rams dyed red and porpoise skins. There they are again, bringing them. Brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought the Lord's contribution. And every man who had in his possession acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. And here's the women. Check how the women responded. All the skillful women, they spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material and in fine linen. All the women, here it is, third time, whose hearts moved, stirred them with skill, spun the goat's hair. We got any goat's hair spunners in the house? All right, bring it. The rulers brought the onk stones and the stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece and the spice and the oil, the light and the anointing. Verse 29, the Israelites, all the men and women, here it is again, whose heart moved them to bring material for all the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses to be done, brought a free, free will offering to the Lord. Here's what I want to sum up, bring all that together in saying, they brought it all, they brought it all with cheerful hearts with hearts excited about what Christ was doing. This morning, may our response be the same as theirs. God, whatever you want, I'll bring it. I want you to hear a story this morning from Steve and Melinda Emerson. They are patriarchs and matriarchs of, of Central Jonesboro, and they were entrusted with this, this moment for Central Jonesboro 20-something years ago. And I want you to hear the story of our church. Central Jonesboro is not a church, it's our church. That's our family. And that, this is what they did 20 years ago. And I, hopefully as you hear that, you are moved from both your, this word and our family story to do it again today. So you guys check out this, this story from the Emersons. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, an interview that I have been looking forward to for a long time. And so, uh, Paragol Campus, we, we love you guys. We're excited that we've been in this journey together over this last month, and we're bringing it all together. And I wanted uh, the last bit of motivation and the last part of encouragement for us to come from these two amazing people here. And so, uh, I am grateful for the Emersons. They're going to introduce themselves here in a moment, but I am grateful for them. You're going to hear a part of their story, and I want us to know from their story uh, that what they are going to share with us is a part of what we are doing now, and so, so excited to have the Emersons with us, and so without further ado, uh, Steve and Melinda, will you introduce yourselves? I'm Steve, and this is my wife, Melinda Emerson. We've been members of Central since we uh, came back from uh, medical school in 1986, and uh, so we have been a part of Central in the process of the building relocation. And I'm gonna tell just a real quick story. We were losing our pastor, and at the time we were getting ready to start a capital campaign. And so he invited me to a meeting and he had an envelope and I opened it up and it said, Chairman Stephen Melinda Emerson. <laughs> so that's how we found out that we were going to have the chairmanship of this capital campaign and we were not going to have a pastor. Wow. So wow. that was a, a, a shocking story for us because we were really not those, not the outgoing you know, type to do all of that. So yeah. it was a challenge and a surprise, but the Lord directed us with a lot of great people and it was an amazing adventure. So a really rocky start, I guess, to a, to a very historic yeah. and exciting time. So, so Central Jonesboro was located downtown and 21 years ago, we've, we've heard the story, uh, but 21 years ago, you guys felt the Lord leading us to locate here to this current location and you guys were in charge of the committee as the pastor is leaving you're informed that, that is going to be what you guys are uh, you are entrusted with and so 
you know, that began to play out and, and stories of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, you guys really, the Lord championed that through you and your family and I love that story too. But one of the, one of the questions I want to ask specifically about your role in this process, because you guys uh, 21 years ago were doing exactly what we are doing in the month of October in 2021. And so um, the first question I want to ask you guys is, is um, how did you see the people, so the, the church family, how did you see them rise to the challenge of giving sacrificially to the building campaign? The theme was called One Heart, One Vision. And so I think that the main thing was that the people's hearts were changed. And there was a unity. There was an excitement. Uh, you don't think of an excitement when you're trying to raise money, but there was. And everyone came together. It was all that we were talking about. And so the people started coming up with all kinds of different ways to be able to raise money and to be able to fulfill their commitments. And their commitments were not something that they could have just written a check and been done. Mm -hmm. By faith, people came and they sought the Lord and they wanted to sacrifice and to sacrifice changed, made them change their hearts. Mm -hmm. But they had a sacrificial commitments over a three year period of time. And so they normally did this by either saving money things that they normally would spend, they put off going on, or buying a new car, put off other things. They may have put off going on an expensive vacation to substitute it for a weekend, things like that. Melinda's going to tell you just what some of the children did. Yeah, the children got involved, uh, even almost more than the parents did. Uh, they started, uh, when they'd go out to eat, they would drink water and take the money that they would have spent on a Coke or a soda and put it in a jar. Uh, some of them had lemonade stands. They had bake sales. They had garage sales. And the, so the children were actually getting money, too. So it was part of their, uh, they were part of the church. But one little girl, I remember, one night came down the aisle and put her piggy bank on the altar. Yes. And, I mean, just that just more people than wanted to give. I and mean, if a child would give everything she had, more people were then encouraged to, to give and to take part in it. You know, we encourage not equal gifts, but equal sales. Sacrifice. There was a family that they were led to donate a hundred thousand dollars that they didn't have, and so the Lord and caused uh, I mean, the Lord provided. But the way He did it was that they were invited to a meeting of a new bank startup. It seemed to have every indicator that it was going to be successful, and they invested a small amount. And as time went. Their investment was $100,000 plus their original investment. Then they, I think they increased it to 150,000 commitment. And by the time it was said and done, their investment was worth 150,000 plus their original investment. Other people gave, uh, that had a furniture store, gave furniture, uh, family provided the kitchen, just all kinds of different things like that. They donated the shotguns, they donated land. jewelry, land. Yeah. And one of the big things that uh, people did, was they had stocks that had really appreciated in value and they were able to donate that and actually get a tax benefit. But people were creative, but the heart of the people was changed. That was the, one of the key things. And the commitments were not something that they could see. It, it was above and beyond what they really, in their normal mind on paper, could afford. Mm -hmm. So they really stepped out in faith. And it goes back to, the, I think, the very first meeting that I ever had with any of the relocation was in December of 1993. And the man that was in charge, that was had so much wisdom, says, if you do this, you will do it by faith. And he started reading the Hebrews faith chapter. And so that's part of this journey, is by faith. Yeah. I love that. You guys got a front row seat to yes. see all of those things. Yes, we really did. And, um, I always say that when you're in God's will, mm -hmm. right here, it smells so good. No, I Most like of the time that. we're like hanging off the side by our fingernails. <laughs> but when you're in the middle of God's will, there's just such perfect peace, even though there's no explanation for it. Right. And and that's kind of where the, the whole church was right here right. in God's hand. I love that. And uh, that's what I love about this church is there's not a man's name on it. Mm -hmm. 
It's this is God's house. Right. And as we built it, that's what we told the builders that were working here. We are working on God's house. Yeah. And they changed their attitude toward the building too. They started to respect it. And uh, you know, it's it, it 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 flowed out all over Jonesboro. Right. It was the talk of Jonesboro. And that's that's one of the things that, that I have been praying is that this would not simply be a, a moment for us to raise money, but this truly would be a revival. Yes. And the prayer that I've been praying is that God would stir the hearts of our people. Um, and, and, and important to note, you guys had never done that before. So you guys had never um, um, built a church from the ground up. Matter of fact, we were talking the other day with a few uh, people from our campus and, and this guy is retired and he said, Blake, I've never been a part of something like this. And he said, and what our young people don't understand, our young couples, they may never get another opportunity to be a part of building a church building from the ground up. He said, it is an honor. It is, God is entrusting that. And you guys got to see that, be a part of that. And um, you even said earlier before the interview that um, a lot of those people aren't here anymore. You know, that they, they left that legacy though for Central Jonesboro and for now Central Perigold to be able to, to carry on that faithful giving. And so um, I love that. Thank you guys for, for sharing that. And so how did you see the Lord respond to those people, all of those stories of faith and sacrificing and changing budgets? And how did you see the Lord respond in the midst of that? Oh, just simply look, look at what He has done. Look where we are. Look at the cornerstone to what you know the Lord you know, provided. You know, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. You know, according to the power that works in us to him be glory through the church through Christ Jesus to all generations. And it's just amazing um, just looking at the, even our student worship, our young adult worship, all of these things are just above and beyond our wildest dreams of what we thought the Lord, but the Lord has honored that and has provided and has and he's actually continued the people that were giving for those three years they kept giving and when we moved into this new complex uh, people the total amount given was a lot more than what was pledged wow. almost double which is unheard of especially yes. me stepping in this process now it's like hey you're you're probably gonna get about 90 percent right. you know even sometimes younger it's lower than that they said but that's amazing that, yes. wow that's incredible and then yes. we were able to pay the building off sooner than we thought yes. because the people continue to give that's amazing. so but central has a legacy of strong faith and strong giving uh, not just not just monetarily, but they give of themselves. They give up their time, and uh, and I, I think that's just what what our church is known. And it's because we put God first. We don't put the pastor first. We don't put the programs first. We put God first in everything yeah. we do. I can't. I I heard that you guys just recently were at the young adult worship service here. Yes. yes. I can't imagine how rewarding that was for y'all to be in this building. That 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 you guys were such a integral part of in building and then seeing people that probably weren't even born in 1986 oh, oh, or maybe you know not to make y'all feel but they, they a lot of them weren't even born yet yes. and now they're in here in this room and they're worshiping Christ and you guys are here watching that like I can't imagine how rewarding that is and 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 hoping that our our campus sees that too a friend of mine and I were talking and, and saying you know his daughter is five and I was like dude she's gonna this is gonna be the, the memories of a home church are gonna be from that building you know she may stay there the rest of her life I mean it, that's so rewarding to think not just the next three-year commitment but the next 30 years the next you know 100 years it's just it's crazy to think about and those children grow up and they become pastors and they become pastors wives and they become missionaries yeah. because of what they learned in the church yeah. that they are building amen I love that I love that what piece of encouragement would you give the Paragold campus you know they're watching this and this is the commitment Sunday for us this is the this is the Sunday where we're putting our faith forward uh, before the Lord and saying, God, this is what I'm committing. And some of them uh, may be committing something that, like that couple that they don't even have, but they feel led of the Lord. Uh, some of them are on the fence. They may be like, we're, we haven't decided to commit anything. What would you tell our campus right now in this historic and pivotal and faith-filled moment? What would you guys share with them? I think first of all that you know nothing is impossible with God. You know God has the money. <laughs> the money's there. I think just seek the Lord, seek his face, 
be humble before him and ask, what, what can I do? And it, it can be scary, especially if you're not used to giving. But I think of the you know, Malachi you know, verse, you know, where bring all the tithes into the storehouse and test me on this, the Lord says, and I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. I'm going to bless you and it's going to be overflowing. And this is a time where giving can cause revival. Giving causes a change in the heart. And I would encourage everyone just to think, there's almost every family unit can save some way $10 a day. We, you just amazing, it's amazing how much we waste or, or spend on things that we don't have to have. You know, if we gave that or had extra jobs or extra shift, things like that to be able to make the ends meet on that, that's a substantial gift, you know, to the kingdom. Other people have a lot more wealth and they need to seek the Lord. There's a few people on every capital campaign that are really key people. And I just pray that they would have the time to seek the Lord and ask the Lord what they need to give. And the Lord will respond. And the Lord, when he does that, I mean, he's going to bless them beyond. And they may wind up being returned with their money so many times they don't even know what to do with it. But uh, and I not just, necessarily with the money. I mean, they're going to be blessed in ways oh, that yes. you can't even imagine with peace and comfort and joy and all the fruit, you know, will be will be given back to them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, well, I love you two both. You know that I do. And uh, yeah, I did want to read that. Yes. Yes. I would uh, love for you to read that. Uh, that you prepared, and you prepared this 20, 20 years ago, 21, 21 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. And it, it really, it, it, I think it kind of answers this question, but how do you come to the amount of your gift? This is the most important aspect of the whole campaign. How you and your family come to this decision will probably change your life. When your family comes together on your knees before God and ask Him what He wants you to do, great things will happen. Don't just look at the total you can afford right now. Think about the next three years and truly seek God. He will bless you. Your family will be strengthened. Your hearts will be softened and God will be glorified. If every family went through this process with God and gave to make this vision become reality, then Central Baptist Church, Paragold Campus will be changed forever. Amen. Amen. That's uh, 21 years ago, yes. still applicable to us today. Yes. And so, well, I love you guys so much. And I share with you earlier, and I mean this, um, when I was coming into this interview, uh, I thought about the pastor of Scripture where Paul says, imitate their faith. And I hope and my prayer is that I and my family and that our campus can imitate the faith of you guys and the and the the, the church and family that was with you in the season 21 years ago and we can do it again here in 2020. There were many people that walked by faith during yeah. that time. Yeah, and I hope we do the same. Yes. Love you guys. Thank you all so much for being with us. Like, thank you. We love you guys too. What we saw this morning, yeah, let me celebrate that. What we saw this morning from God's Word is, is how the Israelites responded to God when He called them to, to go big, to have audacious faith, and to give. We also just heard how Central Jonesboro 21 years ago did the same thing. Without a pastor being led by the Emersons to, to go all in, to trust the Lord, and have their hearts right, and now, this is our moment. This is our time to decide to do what these two groups of people did to continue the legacy of Central Jonesboro or to stuff it and to not be a part of it. God's going to do this stuff with or without you. The invitation is, you want to come on with me? And so this morning, we're going to have a time of commitment where after I pray, Joy and I will take our commitment card and we will place it on this table, leading out first. I'm never going to ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. 
And I shared with you guys with this before. Our, our, our gift is, 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 has really altered our lifestyle and our budget significantly. And I still don't know where we're going to come up with some of it. But we trust the Lord. And I'm excited to be a part of this. And I want to share this with you. There is not one atom in my body. There's not one particle of my soul that does not know with 100% certainty that this is where God's leading us. Not a bit of our past has shown us that God's going to do anything different. He has gone before us. He has worked in ways. This thing has been stopped so many times that we would need another hour to talk about how many walls that I personally or this church has hit that most of you don't know anything about to build this building on that piece of property right there. And he's busted through them. And he's busted through them. And he's busted through them to get us here today. So the invitation for you to commit is for you to be a part of what he's doing. And so I'm going to bring, Joy and I are going to bring our commitment here this morning. Lay it on this table. And then you, you can pray there with your family. And then you all bring it. Your whole family bring it. Maybe just one person bring it. Maybe just you and your child bring it. However you want to do that. But you come forward. You can bring it at the table and then pray over it there. But I'm going to pray over us this morning, and then it's your time to commit. And some of you may be here this morning, and you're like that gentleman that came forward. He didn't have an envelope. He had his heart. His heart wasn't right with Jesus. And so today, he got right with Christ. Today. You might need to come forward this morning with an envelope. You may need to come forward this morning and talk to Pastor Breck or Pastor Chuck with your heart. Because Jesus doesn't have your heart. He always starts in the heart before he moves to the hands. So you get your heart right with Christ this morning. I'm going to pray over you. Joy and I are going to come and place our commitment here. And then you respond. Father, I pray this morning that history would be made in the halls of heaven with this church. That God, we would be an Isaiah 6 church. That as your eyes search to and fro over the nations, over the places and people, this little church in this little corner of Northeast Arkansas would all declare in our hearts, through our voices, through our giving, through our lives, here we are, send us. Father, I pray that you would move people even now. That they would scratch out numbers and put other numbers on their envelope. That God, they, we would all lead this morning in committing from our heart. Not what we can do, but what you've called us to do. Those are big differences. God, I pray that this morning you would do immeasurably more.